Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Apologies for the late start. Uh, welcome to the Regulation of Autonomous Weapons session. Uh, we've got three speakers with us this afternoon, um, all of which have got really interesting comments to tell you, um, which will pick you up from a post-lunch lull. Um, so the, the bios of each of the speakers are on the app, so I won't go into great detail. But to my right, uh, Professor Noel Sharkey. To my left, Nicholas Marsh. And on my far left, uh, Rebecca Krutov. So I'm going to start with Noel, who is going to give you a bit of an overview of what we're even talking about, and then we'll move on to Nick, and then we'll move on to Rebecca. Yes, I, I have the job of explaining what uh, autonomous weapons are, and then I'll speak about some of the difficulties with them. Um, but I just, just, as a, just to say at the start, to qualify it, I, I'm a co-founder of a large coalition of NGOs called the Stop the Killer Robots campaign, which is 54 NG 55 NGOs now uh, from 26 countries, including Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, etc. And we've been working at the UN and the CCW in particular. We'll be there tomorrow um, trying to get a prohibition and treaty on the weapons. So just you should know that so you know my biases before I start. So what are uh, autonomous weapons? Well, at the UN, they've adopted the term lethal autonomous weapons, or LAWS, because it's quite a nice acronym. I'm not so happy with that myself because I think of less than lethal weapons are not good either, but, but that's LAWS. And the definition that's become standard at the UN because of the United States Department of Defence uh, uh, 2012 document uh, 3000.9, which is essentially, I'm paraphrasing, um, a weapon that once released or launched will select, and tar uh, select targets and attack them with violent force without any further human intervention. Now, to qualify that a little bit, what that means is that once the weapon is launched, it's completely under computer control or activated. So to be able to do this, you need some sensors to collect information and put them into the computer. Um, all sorts of sensors, so I mean radar, laser, laser, LIDAR, microphones, any of those, um, any of those, infrared, so sonar. And uh, once the information goes into the computer, the tricky part starts, which is it has to be processed. So that requires software. Some people call it AI, I call it software, because okay, I'm a computer scientist and we're more careful. Um, so, we, so it's processed by software, and once the software has processed it, it will send a control signal to a motor. And that's essentially all you ever need to know about robotics. Sensors taking information into a computer, information processed, and the result of that processing is a control signal being sent to a motor. Now, in the case of autonomous weapons, that would be a weapon. So a motor would control a gun or a machine gun or a you know, missile system. So that, that's, what it, that's what laws are. <coughs> I, hope that's, I hope that's fairly clear. I mean, I can, we can talk about it a little bit more in the, uh, in the discussion. Now, this creates some problems at the United Nations because there are a number of weapons other weapons, also current weapons, that sort of fit this. Uh, and people are bending over backwards to find a, a line for them because for the last 20 years, for instance, we've had the phalanx system on board most U.S. naval ships. And what that, when that's switched on, it detects incoming swarms. It's against swarms, so, and they use it on the Aegis system, so it detects things coming in, sensors, fires on them, but that's military objects, okay. And I've called these SARMO weapons, which is sense and react. The United States calls them supervised autonomy. Uh, France call them material weapons. So they're weapons that really are against um, material, military material objects rather than anti-personnel. Uh, Patriot Systems, another one. The Iron Dome in Israel is another one. So, so these are all defensive weapons. Uh, and that's created some problems, particularly for Germany, because in Germany, the coalition agreement was that they would ban autonomous weapons, but they didn't define them clearly. And they've got things like an automated howitzer. They've got the Mantis, uh, 
and the mantis is used for shooting down mortar fire. So mortar shells coming in, fires a bar detects the trajectory and speed of the mortar shells, fires a barrage in front of them, and uh, brings them down. So quite a useful defensive weapon. Um, now, so, so that's the kind of weapon there are. I still have some problems with it, though, and I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Uh, I don't have real problems with them, but there's a little bit. There's also a whole load of missiles that are coming out now, and, and maybe Nick will speak about that. He's written about them that have autonomous functionality. There's one cusp weapon towards what we're calling laws that we're trying to ban, and that's called the Harpy, and there's also the Harap made in Israel. And that what the Harpy is... And low cast is another name. The U.S. used to use them. The Harpy is a um, what you call a loitering munition. So it looks like an aircraft. It's launched from a rocket. Uh, it loiters over a battlefield. It's sent in before air raids. So it loiters over the battlefield, searching for radar. And as soon as it detects a radar signature, it looks it up on its database. And if it's a um, if it's not on the friendly database the loitering munition turns into a dive bomber and, and goes straight into the radar. Um, that's, that's, you know, there's never been an accident with it, but at the same time, it's not a fully discriminate weapon because if, if the radar was on a hospital roof or a school roof and not attached to a, an anti-aircraft gun, it would still destroy the target. It doesn't, it's not fully discriminative. Um, Israel's response to this is that that would be the people, people's responsibility who put it on the roof. My own view, which is not necessarily legal view, is that it's a shared responsibility. So what's wrong? Why, why would I not like these weapons? Well, one thing, um, I was pretty shocked when I first read about them in 2006. And um, there's real difficulty in compl guaranteeing compliance with uh, international humanitarian law, except under very uh, limited circumstances. And I should really tell you what some of the weapons are. I mean, they're not, they're not being used yet, but they're well under development by six nations that I know of. That's the UK, United States, China, Russia, South Korea, and Israel. Now, United States are not deploying them yet. They have developed the X-47B, which is a fast subsonic fighter craft, uh, in prototype being tested landing and taking off from aircraft carriers in the Pacific the aim is to push the aircraft. It's got 10 times the reach of an F-25, uh, which is the normal uh, plane on board these ships, fighter jet. And the idea is to push further back in the Pacific so that China can't reach them with their missiles because they can sink American aircraft carriers now. And a lot of think tanks like uh, CNAS writing about this are saying this is the only way to defeat China because they outgun the United States, as every report from the RAND Corporation has explained. And so the idea is that we'd use swarms of these uh, weapons against China. It's very saber-rattling, really. Uh, Britain has the Tyrannus, which is an um, intercontinental combat aircraft, fully autonomous. They've tested in Australia looking for targets. They've tested them in teams as well, coordinating with each other, or what they call swarms. Uh, again, no weapons have been deployed from them, but they all have weapons base. And they're all prototypes for testing it. It's not just in the air, though. Oh, well, China have the Anjin, which is actually uh, supersonic, uh, and that's an air-to-air -air combat aircraft, fully autonomous. It's been on the drawing board and being worked on for about seven years now, eight years. But in, on the ground, there are a number of uh, robot weapons, like the Crusher made by Carnegie Mellon for DARPA, the research wing of the Pentagon, and that's a seven-and-a-half-ton truck, which is also fully autonomous and equipped with weapons. There's the Guardian in Israel, which is an uh, autonomous border, border guard that drives... It looks like a bit like a smart car, but an armoured version. Um, now... There was a lot of bragging about all of these weapons, about them being fully autonomous, but of course, since in the last couple of years, since we've been calling for a ban, people have got very coy about saying that, and everybody says when they talk about it now, they used to always have their website saying, this will be fully autonomous, etc. But now, of course, it's, it's fully autonomous, but the weapons are remote controlled. But they all have switched for autonomy. South Korea have... Uh, it is, they are robots, but they're like on stalks. They're machine guns on stalks that can rotate with sensors. And they're pointed into the demilitarized zone. And when I've been to South Korea, they, they, you know, they, uh, their defense people have said that 
it's for exceptional circumstances. They're very worried about being swarmed by North Korea. So those are, and Russia is actually deploying autonomous uh, little robot tanks to defend its missile, uh, ballistic missile sites within Russia. So again, nobody's, nobody's actually using them, but they're all pushing for development. Russia has set up a new DARPA, and it's called the Russian DARPA, though it's got nothing to do with DARPA, in Moscow for developing autonomous robot weapons. So not so good. So the problem is, how can these comply with the laws of war? Well, something like the X-47B, for instance, could be used in a limited circumstance. It could be used in place of a cruise missile. So you could give it coordinates, send it to a bridge, for instance, and it could release two Hellfire missiles costing $35,000 each rather than a $2 million cruise missile and then can return home again. So there are these kind of small limited circumstances. But the problem is you can't guarantee compliance because you can't test it properly. Okay? Um, and you know, if you start looking at Article 36 weapons reviews, how are people going to test these? Because we're really worried about, I mean, it's not just the United States. One of the big problems is some of the nations believe that they're the only people developing these, and when they do scenarios, and you see all these scenarios from think tanks, all of the other nations' weapons are always static, frozen in time as they are now. But that's not going to be the case. I mean, there will be proliferation, the same way as there was with drones. So it's a worry, because only... 12 to 15 of the 174 nations that have signed up for uh, Article uh, 36 review, uh, sorry, for Protocol 1, additional Protocol 1, 174 nations have signed that, not the United States, not Russia or China. And of those 174 nations, only 12 to 15 have any capability for testing uh, under Article 36. And including those that haven't signed additional Protocol 1, only 20 in the world have, have got capability for doing the testing. And the testing is really costly and very expensive. You cannot formally verify an autonomous weapon system. You can't for formally verify much in terms of programs, except a very simple, like 15 or 20 lines. Uh, my department at Sheffield have 40 of the best, the biggest uh, group in Europe who work on formal verification, and that's about what they can do. So when it comes to an autonomous weapon system, you can't formally verify that it will always react in the way it should. So the only way of doing this is by empirical testing. You actually have to try and exhaustively test it, and that's almost impossible to do, especially when you've got unanticipated enemy adaptations, other autonomous weapons, etc. So there's a real problem there. Um, and what happened in the last couple of... I've been saying this for quite a while, but what happened last year and the year before was the International Committee of the Red Cross, Chatham House, and a number of other think tanks brought a lot of roboticists together from all the different sectors, uh, from military, from industrial, from academia. Uh, and <clears throat> there was pretty much agreement, except for one roboticist, um, but there's been pretty much agreement, if you read the ICRC report, that these things will not be able to comply with the laws of war into the foreseeable future. Now, beyond the foreseeable future, I don't know. Foreseeable future means you're looking at what's available now in terms of automatic target recognition. You're looking at what proposals are on the table for, for uh, tender. You're looking at what research is ongoing at the moment. So the foreseeable future, this is not going to happen. And as I say, if you're basing it, once these, the trouble is that once these things get underway, once there's billions of dollars being spent on them, I don't think there's much chance of pulling back from it. Proportionality at the moment would be impossible. It would be impossible for, for the qualitative decision that's required for proportionality decisions to be made by a machine. Now, some lawyers, I'm not saying anyone's here, but some lawyers say that, uh, of course, lawyers believe in the law. That's their job, and that they should be. Uh, so they say if it doesn't comply with the laws of war, they won't be used. Okay. But you know, history says something different, as we know from things like aerial bombardment, one of the most indiscriminate forms of warfare there was, where in 1938 the President Roosevelt wrote to all of the European uh, nations <laughs> pleading with them to not use aerial bombardment because it was a completely discriminatory form of warfare. And seven years later, the United States was dropping nuclear weapons with them. So we can see where that goes, whether it's against the laws of war or not. Once there's a momentum, once a lot of people have them, you're, you're stuck with them, really. Uh, there's also the problem of 
checking the legitimacy of targets. And I don't spend too long because these other people need to speak, but I just want to say um, one more little bit about this, is that one of my biggest concerns is, that, is this idea of, of nations being very blinkered in what I've just mentioned, the idea that they're the only people that have them. They're not really thinking... Um, what happens when everybody else gets them? And maybe not everybody will get them, but certainly China, Russia, United Kingdom, America, Europe, all the major technical nations will have them. And then, you know, if there's no restrictions, if there's no ban, we start getting exports because some countries will just export them. Can I guarantee... I mean, when I talk to people in the US who are very US-dominated... They say, oh, we stick to the law and we, we'll, you know, make them, we'll make sure they're moral and things. But are they speaking to, for all the countries in the world? I don't think so. And will a country be able to stand up and say, we're making our robots much safer and they won't kill anyone else and they won't cause collateral damage when other countries are getting an advantage on them? I don't think so either. So global security is a real problem. And just listing some of the things, I have a leaflet here, but unfortunately they couldn't print it, so... Uh, sort of things worry about arms race, proliferation, lowered threshold for going to warfare, no soldiers being hurt. We're already seeing that with drones. <coughs> Continuous global battlefield where you just leave these things around after you've had a, ha- had a battle, as you do with drones now, but these are worse because they use less battery. You can leave them hovering for a long, long time. Um, accelerating pace of battle, and this is really this really disturbs me because a lot of the talk from militaries about using autonomous weapons, and not commanders, I mean, soldiers are generally not in favour of these, but very senior people, talking about the battlefield is becoming too fast for humans' judgement. It's much too fast, so we need autonomous weapons, like we do for shooting down missiles. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that really disturbing. And we have things like the HTV2 programme in the United States, where they tested the Falcon hypersonic unmanned aircraft and the idea is to get a a swarm or a team of those anywhere on the planet within the window of one hour. Now that travels at 22,000 kilometres an hour. It's still under initial testing but that's what it's been tested at. So that really worries me combined with the idea that if if you have like the Wall Street flash crash, if you have two computer programs competing with each other and you don't know what the contents of those programs are and I assure you, nobody will ever give away their combat program, how the thing's going to work. Because if you do, you're defeated immediately. So the idea that these things will interact together, no one on this planet, myself or any other scientist I know, can predict what will happen when they interact. And you know, think about accidental conflict starting, autonomous weapons, who can pull the plug first? Well, ever who pulls the plug first is sunk quite clearly. It's like a doomsday machine in many, in many sort of possible ways. There's also the problem of cyber vulnerability, but I think I'll stop and let my fellow panellists get on with it. <laughs> I'll take up all the time. Uh, we can discuss this at you know, length in a bit. Um, yeah, thanks very much, and uh, at the start, I'd like to say thanks very much to the EU Non-Proliferation Consortium for inviting me here. Um, and oh, is that better? Yeah, I think so. Uh, so the the subject for discussion today is is how to regulate autonomous weapons. Um, I'll first just start by saying that this is a, a very small part of uh, a, a very large issue uh, which will face the world um, uh, in the decades to come. Uh, and that is how do we manage, how do we um, interact with, how do we regulate artificial intelligence. Um, we have the first autonomous cars are on the road. They don't need a driver. We have autonomous trucks are being uh, developed. Um, and, you know, we, we don't have to be too fanciful to imagine that, uh, you know, when my seven-year-old son is uh, as old as I am, that a very large amount of the technology that he's interacting with uh, will be operating autonomously. Um, so, uh, and this is something that humanity, you know, will have to get a, get a grips with. Um, I'll also uh, say uh, just a, a, a thing at the start. The uh, the title of the seminar is about regulation. Um, uh, 
uh, Noel uh, is in favor of prohibition. Um, I'll be talking, I'll refer to regulation uh, in the talk, but within that I'm, uh, I'll, I'll just say regulation because I can't be bothered to say regulation or prohibition. Uh, and I've got a sore throat and my voice may fail, so I'll, I'll try and save it. So, um, uh, And so what I'll talk about is three issues which states will need to address um, if, if and when they start to uh, uh, negotiate uh, an international agreement to regulate um, lethal autonom autonomous weapon systems. Um, the, the first issue is how to define um, what equipment is being regulated. Um, Having worked on a few uh, sort of international instruments myself, uh, you, you find that uh, definitions take up an enormous amount of time, uh, and things which appear to be fairly simple at the outset um, become extremely complex. So, so the definition of what is being regulated will be will be very <coughs> difficult. Uh, and here, the key issue is that the the development of the technology has been evolutionary, it's been incremental. So we're not going to have uh, an object which is an autonomous system which arrived which is completely different from anything that has been around before. Um, uh, Noel mentioned various forms of technology that existed in the past. And when you're looking at uh, the campaign that Noel's part of and other people have written about it, you can see a progression from what's called automatic systems uh, through to automated systems, uh, and then what is termed semi-autonomous, uh, and then finally autonomous systems. Um, and when obviously there's lots of different people writing on the issue have different points of view, but I'd say as a general rule, when people are talking about autonomous systems, we're talking about uh, a weapon which has a fairly complex interaction with its environment. Um, that it, as, as Noel was saying, that it receives information from sensors, it has a degree of decision-making on board, and then it carries out decisions, as Noel was saying, without a human supervising those. Um, I'll give you an example uh, of this progression uh, with anti-shipping weapons. Um, if we look uh, back to 1943, um, you can see the, the sort of very earliest uh, system was the acoustic torpedo. Uh, so this was a very basic weapon. It was an, a torpedo which fired from a submarine. Um, it was uh, German submarines at the time. Uh, it listens for the noise of a ship's propellers, then homes in on those propellers uh, and hopefully destroys the ship. Um, relevant to this discussion because if it's, say, fired at a convoy, the crew of the submarine firing it do not know which ship it's going to hit. Um, it also came up with a problem, uh, as you can imagine, in that some of the, certainly some of the early ones, started hitting the submarine that fired it as well, which they, they had to try and deal with. So that, that's the sort of the very earliest example of the technology. Um, when we get to the 1960s, 1970s, uh, you get radar-guided anti-shipping missiles, um, most famous, the, the French Exocet missile. Um, and then the Exocet would be launched towards the area uh, where, say, a pilot had, a, had identified a target. The missile would then not use its internal radar while it was traveling towards the target to avoid alerting the, the target that a, the missile was heading towards there. Uh, and then when it was near the area where the ship, target ship was thought to be, it would switch on its radar, acquire a target. Um, if there were several blips on the radar, so to speak, it would uh, target one of those. Uh, it would also be able to select a new target if it was distracted by countermeasures, for example. So here we have uh, a more complex system, but still one that is, is fairly simple. Uh, it's, it's looking for the biggest blip on the radar within a certain area. Um, so then uh, we, we can see that kind of system, um, and uh, as discussed by the campaign, uh, being described as um, uh, the most semi-autonomous, that it, it, it doesn't have a complex interaction with the environment. If we're looking at the current generation of anti-shipping missiles, um, I'll give an example of the, the American long-range anti-ship missile. Uh, now, according to Lockheed Martin, the, the manufacturer, um, uh, and, and obviously when I'm talking about claims made by manufacturers, we have to take them with a degree of salt. It's 
as uh, lots of weapons don't function in the way that manufacturers claim. Um, uh, what the long-range anti-shipping missile um, has is uh, sensors which allow it to first locate other warships that have anti-missile armament on them and then bypass them, fly around them. So if it, if it detects passively, for example, um, an anti-missile radar up ahead, it will fly around that warship. Um, uh, it uses both uh, uh, millimetric band radar and passive centers, such as infrared, to autonomously search for a target. Um, it, the, it will then compare the information received from its sensors with an internal 3D model of the potential target ships, hopefully to be able to distinguish between, say, friendly ships, neutral ships, uh, and enemy ships. Um, and then it uh, will select a target, um, hit that target, um, all without necess necessarily without a human actually being involved. Uh, it's possible to have a, a data link between, say, the aircraft that fires it or not, but um, it, it can do all that on its own. Uh, and if, if that wasn't enough, several missiles uh, can communicate with each other, share information, so you can have a, an attack of several of these missiles at the same time. Um, so the long-range anti-shipping missile is able to dynamically interact with its environment, uh, independently select targets, uh, and its uh, you know, pr production has started recently. Um, when we're looking at the future... Uh, there's discussions of uh, autonomous uh, subsurface and surface um, vessels. Um, now, the, the question then is whether they're armed, because then you're looking at a, a vehicle which would be um, potentially on patrol for a very long period of time uh, and away uh, from human interaction. And also, as Noel said, if it's a sub uh, a submarine, uh, it may be very difficult to cont contact it um, at all. Um, so then um, the, the message there is that when we're looking at the development of these systems, we can see the technology getting more complex um, in incrementally over time. Um, but the, the difficulty for an international instrument to regulate this kind of uh, equipment is deciding, well, exactly where do we draw the line um, at what point do we say that this is uh, fully autonomous and shouldn't be allowed? Uh, and uh, uh, where do we decide um, that sort of less complex systems are, are still acceptable? Um, and it's, uh, it's very difficult to decide where that line would be. Um, you have, uh, to start with systems, may well have a mixture um, of autonomous and remotely controlled features. So you may have a system that can be re remotely controlled, say, most of the time, but then have an option to be an autonomous. Um, you also, if you, if you look at the target acquisition functions, say, acquiring, tracking, selecting, attacking targets, you may have different levels of autonomy um, within those different activities within the same system. Um, uh, and then you may have different levels of autonomy within different contexts as well. So a system which is remotely controlled in one context may be able to be autonomously controlled in others. Um, uh, and so it, it's, uh, in terms of actually negotiating an instrument, that's, that's going to be one of the, the most difficult thorny issues, um, is where do we actually draw that line. Uh, the second... Uh, issue is on what's called meaningful human control. Uh, this seems to be the, the phrase that everyone agrees is a good idea, um, or almost everyone, um, that, uh, that when people are talking about it, uh, it's, it's generally that we want meaningful human control of weapons. Um, uh, but there's very little agreement over what that actually means. Um, and uh, as, as Noel pointed out, a key problem with autonomous systems is a potential lack of predictability um, on the battlefield. That when you have a complex machine interacting uh, in a complex battlefield, uh, it may do all sorts of things which the person who uh, is nominally in command of it uh, may not intend, or, or it may do things which the people who designed it and built it couldn't imagine it would do. Um, so 
people want there to be human control because humans are uh, potentially more reliable. Um, uh, now, we, we have, uh, and Noel has made an eloquent uh, sort of comment on that, that a, one option is just to say that a human has to control every single individual target. That if, if, a, if a weapon selects a target, a human has to review that. Um, that would obviously be the, the strongest form of regulation. Um, um, but uh, when we're looking at the discussion, you can see meaningful human control being talked about in lots of other different contexts, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about. Um, uh, first is concerning the types of targets. Uh, so you may um, have a, a lethal autonomous system which is only designed to attack a certain type of military target. Uh, it could be, as I said, an anti-ship missile will only should only attack shipping. Um, you, you could have, uh, for example, Noel mentioned things like the phalanx, um, close-in weapon systems uh, often put on ships. They're only designed to attack um, other missiles or, or aircraft attacking the ship. Um, so limiting it to a particular type of target is one option. Uh, you also have uh, potential to limit the geographical area uh, in which a weapon operates. So if uh, a commander is um, using them within a battlefield, they may decide they can only operate within a certain area of a battlefield. Uh, however, if, again, if we're looking at missiles, uh, they may be, you know, with, with a range, they may be able to potentially cover hundreds or even thousands of square kilometers. So again... With some kinds of systems, even if it was geographically limited, it wouldn't be very much. Um, uh, you may have the context in which the system is used. Uh, so uh, it could be that they're only used in less complex environments. Um, uh, you know, for example, um, uh, could, could only be used against aircraft or, or against... Um, sea targets but not on land because land is a, an awful lot more difficult. You have civilians on land usually um, whereas uh, in air or sea there are less of them although obviously the, the shooting down of the uh, Malaysian airliner over Ukraine in, in, you know, shows how even in a, an air environment you can have uh, a lot of civilian activity. Or, or there's also the issue of time uh, and that's a, a sort of de facto limits a lot of the other contexts. So when you're looking at missiles for example um, uh, some of the comments have been, that, well, they're only flying for a very short period of time, therefore we don't need to worry about them so much. And it's systems which are, uh, say, uh, could be deployed for hours or, or, or days even are, are, are the real concern. Um, and then in, in a second facet of the meaningful human control is what kind of standard do we set for the human who's actually in control these systems. Um, in, in some discussions, it's often assumed that a human uh, on the battlefield possesses accurate situational awareness of the war zone, uh, that they're able to distinguish between military and civilian targets. Um, uh, they can distinguish between those enemy combatants that are fighting or those trying to surrender or those that are injured. Uh, and that's how they can conform with the humanitarian law. Um, but often, uh, soldiers don't have that awareness. Um, uh, sometimes, for example, a, a human will be just be looking at a blip on a radar screen. Um, all you have is a, an aircraft approaching you. you. You maybe know the height, the velocity, but that's it. Um, or you may have someone has received very vague or inaccurate intelligence um, that there are, you know, Taliban in this building, and that's all you have. Um, so then the question is, if we're going to have meaningful human control over lethal autonomous systems, what kind of situational awareness does the human have to have in order to ex exercise that control? Um, again, it's, it's easy to raise that question, much more difficult to, to actually set out what that needs to be. Um, the final issue um, is, a, is a bit more practical, um, but I'll start with a little bit of philosophy. Um, uh, if, if we're looking overall, uh, I mean, we're at a non-proliferation non conference. Um, you know, why do we work on arms control um, when 
you know, the, the, the bad effects, the deleterious effects of weapons are already illegal. It's, it's, it's already illegal to target civilians, etc. Um, th- there are many reasons to, to work on arms control, obviously. But one of those uh, is that prohibiting or regulating weapons is easier. Um, they're usually a physical object. They can be identified. They can be monitored. If someone is, say, using cluster munitions, those cluster munitions can be located on the battlefield. You know what's happening. Um, now, when we're looking at the difference between an autonomous weapon uh, or, a, or a more earlier generation of, of weapons, uh, and going back to the discussion on boundaries I was talking about, the, the difference between them is in software. Um, now, software, uh, it po- you know, regulating software poses uh, quite a lot of practical difficulties. Uh, there's the issue of accountability is one. Um, when or if uh, an autonomous system behaves unpredictably in a way which wasn't intended, who's responsible? Is that uh, the person who wrote the software or the company, or is it the person who issued the order? Um, but also... Uh, software poses quite severe problems for verification uh, or enforcement of any uh, potential international instrument uh, regulating or prohibiting lethal autonomous weapons. Uh, you can update software instantly. Um, it's difficult, if not impossible, to share code, uh, which is driving a machine without revealing the technical specifications of that weapon. So if you're talking about people being able to inspect the software inside a potential uh, potential lethal autonomous weapon, um, that's going to pose a very difficult challenge for states that want to keep the technical specifications um, secret. Um, uh, So uh, a a way to actually verify or or report or monitor (coughs) whether states are actually complying with any regulations uh, is going to be is going to be rather difficult. Um, so, in conclusion, uh, I mean, I'd like to say that you know I, I'm not trying to say at all that regulating lethal autonomous weapons is impossible um, or shouldn't be attempted. Uh, I, I'd be prepared to bet that before every arms control agreement ever made, uh, someone somewhere was saying that it would be impossible or, or unrealistic. Um, so, uh, but what I was uh, trying to point out was where. The, the difficulties are going to be and what we will need to be focused on when we move uh, from a campaign to have some kind of regulation to, okay, what kind of regulation are we going to have? Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Um, so on that note, the regulatory side. All right. Um, hi, uh, my name is Rebecca Krutoff. And I also uh, want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm a PhD in law at Yale Law School, and my work focuses generally on the interplay between law and new technology, both how new technology pushes legal norms to develop in new ways and also how law can be used to responsibly channel the development of new technology to promote socially desirable aims. And I have two main points to make today. One is that we have a lot of relevant general law regulating autonomous weapon systems already. And my second point, and will betray the fact that I am a lawyer, we need more. (laughs) We need more law. Uh, We need more specific law uh, to address some of the issues that my co-panelists raised. Uh, So first, I'm just going to briefly describe some of the relevant law that does exist relevant to autonomous weapon systems. Uh, Most obviously, the law of armed conflict Uh, regulates the use of different weaponry. Um, Some people are less familiar with the fact that it also operates in peacetime to regulate the development of new weapons. So um, as Noel mentioned, we have Article 36 reviews that are designed to ensure that all new weaponry at the very, and this is a floor, but at the very least is not by nature indiscriminate and does not cause unnecessary suffering. So all new weapons are supposed to comply with these laws. Compliance is a different issue, of course. Um, Additionally, the law of armed conflict governs the use of weaponry in attacks, and there we have the issues like proportionality, distinction, feasible precautions, different ways, uh, different requirements on any specific attack. And um, Noel and I uh, disagree a bit in that he says that 
uh, autonomous weapon systems won't be able to be used in compliance with these different legal requirements for attacks. I've argued that the ones in use today demonstrate that they can be used lawfully, that they are current, there are autonomous weapon systems in use today that are being used in ways that are proportional and discriminant. And partially that has to do with where they're being used and partially that has to do with how they're being used, but they are capable of being used in compliance with the law of war won't always mean that they are used in that way, and that is a big concern of mine. Uh, but in addition to the law of armed conflict, which most people recognize is applicable, I also just wanted to raise other legal regimes that also govern the use of autonomous weapon systems. So this includes human rights law, which will obviously uh, interplay with the law of armed conflict uh, during situations of armed conflict, but is also very relevant in anti-terrorism activities, in situations involving the use of force that falls below the threshold for armed conflict, and also uh, in domestic law enforcement to the extent that we start seeing things like autonomous weapon systems incorporated in different domestic law enforcement um, areas. This is problematic, but as evidenced by at least the U.S. experience where drones were first used uh, internationally in armed conflict and, and then in anti-terrorism activities and now are being used in law enforcement, um, I expect to see sort of a similar evolution with autonomous weapon systems. Uh, other legal regimes that are relevant, I'm just going to blow over them quickly, law of the sea, autonomous weapon systems might develop and become warships, and to the extent that they are, they will be governed by the, law of the same laws that apply to other warships. Uh, space law, autonomous weapon systems are ideal for use in space, in large part because they don't require a human operator, um, and to the extent they're used in space, they're going to be governed by many of the, the treaties and customary international law relevant to space law. And then there's a bunch of, of other lesser, well, I don't want to say lesser, but slightly less obviously relevant legal regimes like telecommunications law, um, air passage, uh, and I've detailed these in, a, in one paper I wrote. But that is to say there are lots of interlocking, you know, inter different legal regimes that together form a sort of broad general rules for use of autonomous weapon systems that are going to need to be considered in different contexts. That being said, we also need a lot more specific law that regulates specific issues relevant to autonomous weapon systems. Um, I share Noel's skepticism for lawyers that say uh, if something is against the law, it won't be used. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, history has uh, shown that is not the case. Uh, but for that very reason, I am concerned with the idea of uh, a prohibition and thinking that a prohibition is going to be a successful response to autonomous weapon systems. Uh, I've conducted a historical study of different attempted and successful weapon bans to look at what are the factors relevant to when it is possible to successfully ban the use of a certain kind of new weaponry. And in doing so, I looked at attempted bans on crossbows, on submarines, cluster munitions, landmines, etc. And I found that in general, I think autonomous weapon systems tend to share more characteristics with weapon systems that we have not successfully been able to ban, like submarines, like crossbows, than they do with weapon systems or types of weapons that we have. And so given this, uh, so they're, they're, I think they're more akin to submarines than they are to permanently blinding lasers for a variety of reasons. Given this, I think we need to focus efforts on how to best regulate them uh, as opposed to focusing efforts on pro prohibiting them um, precisely because just because something is, if something, if there is a legal prohibition that won't necessarily mean it's going to be complied with. Um, but law can be useful in directing development in certain ways at once if it also takes state interest into account. So the two main issues I think we need law to address is one, very relevant to this meeting, uh, proliferation. There's no general law uh, about weapons proliferation. Um, to the extent it exists, it exists in specific treaty regimes or specific agreements between states. And I think we need to address um, the potential spread of autonomous weapon systems, and we need, we need agreements uh, to be able to do that. Uh, second is the issue of accountability. This is perhaps the most unique aspect of autonomous weapon systems from a legal perspective. Uh, 
fact is that because of their capability for independent action, because they can do things with superhuman reaction time, they are uniquely effective in a number of scenarios. Um, and, and this is useful for states, and this is why we've had defensive autonomous weapon systems being used more and more. The, the bad aspect of their autonomy is, or the problematic aspect of their autonomy, is that there is no accountability when they take an unpredictable action. Under international criminal law, people can only be held accountable, individuals can only be held accountable if there's willful action, which means if an individual acts with intention or recklessly. But the possibility of autonomous weapon systems acting unpredictably raises the possibility that there will be, they will take an action that nobody, nowhere along the spectrum of programmers, designers, manufacturers, commanders, deployers, et cetera, nobody ever intended that action, nobody ever acted recklessly, and so nobody could be held accountable for serious violations of IHL, uh, international humanitarian law, the law of war, taken by autonomous weapon systems. And I think we need to identify, you know, address this legal lacuna. Um, all right, so different uh, regulations. Ideally, we would have a clarified definition, as Nicholas has laid out. There are a lot of, there's a lot of confusion regarding what exactly, what kinds of weapon systems, at what levels of, uh, different levels of autonomy require what different uh, regulations, um, the issue of meaningful human control, what is that actually going to look like, those words. Right, that's an intuitively, inherently appealing idea. Everybody likes the idea of meaningful human control, but everybody disagrees on what that actually is going to entail. Um, so regulations that addressed proliferation and ideally regulations that also address accountability. And I have a paper I've recently put forward that argues that the best way to address accountability is creating a strict liability regime for states. And I'd be happy to talk more about that and why I think this is actually a, a situation where it'd be feasible to have, feasible from a state interest perspective uh, to create that kind of strict liability. Uh, and these new regulations and new laws could take a variety of forms. Obviously, treaty law would in many ways be the most ideal in that it would be codified, clear, negotiated, um, and, and clearly law. Uh, to the extent a treaty might not be possible for political reasons, um, also, we could have new law coming through UN resolutions and even uh, through state practice, through industry practice, through development of codes of conduct and uh, general agreements, um, and even as evidenced by the fact uh, that the U.S. definition for autonomy and weapon systems has become the accepted definition at the UN, domestic law, domestic policy can be a useful way of creating new norms that spread and, and create new systems of, of governance and law. So I think new law can happen in a variety of ways. I think it's going to happen. I think ideally we should be proactive about developing that law, that it shouldn't just follow the development of autonomy and weapon systems. Um, but yes, I think we need it. Okay, great. Um, Um, can keep it punchy in the interest of time. <laughs> Just to respond to a couple of remarks there, mm -hmm. um, Nick was was right about the, the <coughs> great the great difficulties here, and I don't actually disagree with Rebecca at all. But it mm -hmm. just depends on what you put in the box. Um, and the United States, Britain, and some other Western nations were very careful at the CCW to say and insisted that the wording should be emerging technologies, mm -hmm. okay, so they won't discuss non-ones. China wanted it to be uh, existing and emerging, but the UK said they would veto it if that was the case, so, so that, that's what happened there. But in terms of definitions, I, I'm always torn by this because uh, I'm an academic, so I like to define everything, and I do define it in my papers, but in terms of the working uh, campaigning at the UN, it's much more important to bring nations together and get them to discuss this. And it is certainly the hottest topic in disarmament circles at the UN at the moment. It's really gathering momentum. At the, at the General Assembly just now, 30 nations brought it up and said we should move forward with it. Um, massive uh, discussion about it. 30 nations and five groups of nations, including the NAM nations, which is about 80 states, mm 
so there's a, there's a lot of momentum for it. Nine nations have already called for a ban, and 12 nations want to move. At the moment, it's been in formal expert meetings. So in 2012, sorry, 2013, wrong again, 2014, 2015, we've had a four-day and a five-day informal meeting of experts at the CCW to discuss this. And... Twelve nations at the last one, including the United States, said it's time now to move for a, GG, uh, sorry, a group of governmental experts to intensify the discussions and look at what, it, what they would ban. And I'm, cer I'm pretty certain myself that something will be banned. Whether it's something I want to be banned or not is another matter. That's all other thing. But in terms of meaningful human control, I mean, you, you, you know, I've written papers about supervisory control and try to avoid that term in my academic writing, but it's, it's caught people at the United Nations and essentially what we're saying to them is, you know, you tell us what you think it is and we'll see if we agree. That's the way of negotiating in a campaign as opposed to being an academic, if you see what I mean. And it's the same with the, with the weapon systems. Where do you think you would draw the line? What is meaningful human control? And clearly, the, the ones we've got at the minute, which you know, the United States has bent over backwards to call it supervised autonomy because there's somebody there to switch it on and off. They tend, if you can, I'll send you my definitions of it, fixed base that's been through the militaries. Um, but of course then there's heat seeking missiles and those things but they all have very small baskets of acquisition as they say so when they're launched you know the targets there there's no well you hope you know the targets there and there are no airliners in the facility or whatever so it's so it's all being very carefully controlled so that's just that's what I want to respond to okay great let's take this to the floor um, can you when you get the microphone can you please say who you are and where you come from and what I've just said to Noel, in the interest of time, and I know we started late, can we keep it punchy so we can get through as many as possible? Anybody? Um, Paul Schultz from um, Birmingham University in Carnegie. Uh, what is to be done? Uh, I've, what I hear is a great deal of anxiety. Uh, I don't hear the possibilities of effective verification, which seems to be extremely difficult. I hear there's a requirement for more law, but I don't know how it's going to be enforced. I don't hear about some of the more complicated counter-arguments about the possibility of preci additional precision from autonomous weapons and it, fearlessness and in, indifference to their own destruction, which might lead conceivably to, to more humanitarian and, and precise uh, military action. Uh, I'm left with, as so often on these uh, discussions, a, gr a great deal of undifferentiated concern, but no pr realistic proposals for what should be done. Because, partly because we are faced with a situation where there are probably things being developed beyond the list that Noel Sharkey gave. We don't know anything about. We don't have any idea of what a regime would look like to find them. We don't know how to define what should be banned, and we don't know how to verify how that ban would be enforced. Um, this doesn't suggest that there's a very coherent proposed way forward, but maybe I'm wrong. I think you are wrong. I think there is a coherent way, and I think I just proposed it. We, we're, we're dealing and negotiating with nations to have a ban. I think that you can't be much more coherent than that. But I think you're absolutely right about precision. Um, that's one of the arguments. At the moment, automatic target recognition is pretty bad. I mean, if you're in the sea, that's fine. If you've got a tank in the middle of the desert with nothing else near it, yes, that's OK. But, but if you look at precision... That's the very reason why, I'm sorry I couldn't give you this leaflet, but that's the very reason why we're looking at the global problem of the problems for global security, because precision aren't, isn't going to cure that. And um, some of my writings, I, I'm glad you brought that question up, because in some of my writings I actually talk about how you can use this technology, because the only thing we're trying to get banned is not autonomy. I mean, I work in autonomous robotics all my life. So I'm very passionate about it. So it's not dual-purpose stuff. It's just the targeting selection of targets and the killing that we're, we're trying to get banned. It's very, very precise in that way. But you can use this technology. I mean, if our... Go I'm sorry, I'm going to preach a bit now. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to hear the others. Okay, I, I, you will hear them. You will hear them. Yeah, you will hear them. You will hear them if you don't interrupt me. Um, 
Uh, if you would like to look at the technology, you could use this technology to make much better targeting decisions for humans, and that's one of the things we're not doing. Rather than having precision as a side effect because you don't want to use too much ammunition, if you actually had the goal of making weapons that were more precise in the sense of causing less collateral damage, using this advanced technology to do better targeting, then it would be an awful lot better. Uh, all right, so what is to be done? Uh, there are a lot of people valiantly working for a prohibition, and I think that that is a useful endeavor and has been hugely important in getting this conversation started and, and having us be able to discuss these issues. Um, I think, the, personally, the best way forward is to start with a framework convention, ideally a, a rather small treaty along the lines of uh, the Convention on Conventional Weapons, which we have a small independent treaty that clarifies things that we can all agree on right now. So things like the applicability of the law of war to autonomous weapon systems, which just stating that and clarifying that will go a long way towards eliminating some confusion about how different aspects of the law of war apply to autonomous weapon systems. Think a discussion of the, the extremes, right? There is a lot of confusion in the definition in the middle ground, but I think everybody is very comfortable saying, we don't want berserker weapons out there shooting people, right? <laughs> and that, you know, whether or not governments are ever going to create such things uh, is unlikely, but at least defining and banning that far end of the spectrum could be, could be useful as a place of creating agreement to start with a framework convention. And then I think it would be useful for such a framework convention to have a bunch of additional protocols that could be address different specific issues. So a protocol regarding nonproliferation of autonomous weapon systems, a protocol regarding state accountability for the actions of autonomous weapon systems that could draw from the articles of state responsibility um, and customary international law of state responsibility and draw from the international criminal law framework that's been developed to clarify when individuals are going to be held accountable for the actions of autonomous weapon systems that they employ and at the same time how states should overarchingly, regardless of individual liability, criminal liability, states should overarchingly be held responsible both for deploying autonomous weapon systems and for compensating uh, victims of their actions. Um, so that would be my specific <laughs> suggestions on the way forward. Um, yeah. yeah. Sorry, just a, a brief follow-up. Um, if, if you're asking what, what will happen, um, at least in developed countries, uh, warfare is already highly regulated. Um, you have, uh, you know, uh, people on the battlefield have, have an enormous amount of regulations they have to follow already concerning what they can do, how they can do it. Um, so I think it's inevitable that at the national level you are, there will have to be some regulations, in part because uh, governments don't want the adverse effects that we've been talking about. You, you don't want to accidentally destroy a school or uh, end up... Uh, uh, having a system accidentally targeting one of your allies or, or one of your troops. So there, there will be some kind of regulation. Um, the question is, will that be coordinated? Will you have common standards internationally? Will you have um, uh, a common idea of what, what kind of limit is too far, what is acceptable? Uh, or is this going to be just done at a national level or within, say, groups of states? Uh, gentleman at the back. Yes. A few quick questions for clarification, I guess mostly to Rebecca. Sorry. Mostly to Rebecca, but to the others. Sorry, can you what, say? Sorry, can you say yeah, that? it's Ari Levita from the Carnegie Endowment. One is, what, would, what is the impact if you actually have a, a, an on-off switch that you can actually operate uh, uh, autonomously, but it could also operate in a switch? Sort of, it looks like, like to me that like it will make the proliferation control a nightmare. So that's one question. Second question is, how do you actually define a weapon? Is something that denies service, uh, for example, in cyber, is that necessarily a weapon? So, I mean, you talked about the importance of definitions, but I would wish to draw you and Mar and, and Nicolas and others, I mean, draw out on the issue of actually how you define a weapon is distinguished. The third is the concept of self-defense. Um, 
And, and here, I think that one of the major drivers is not just cost and so on, but the, um, the importance we attach to self-defense in many of these scenarios and their, the, the desire to employ these systems, particularly in scenarios that require an immediate response. Um, and so how uh, uh, maybe, uh, I'll, I'll frame it this way, maybe we actually want more not just from, uh, um, from, the, from the value of, of uh, saving costs and so on, but maybe in order to save human lives, we do want more autonomous systems. And so the challenge is there for striking that balance. I, what I missed in your discussion is not just a discussion of the military efficacy, but perhaps some of the considerations of what lies on, sort of in, on the balance in terms of what we gain by introducing autonomous systems, not just for purposes of military efficiency, but serve a broader societal goal. So I'd like to, to kind of pepper your discussion with those, with those questions. Thank you. Um, all right, so those are three very different, very important issues. Uh, the idea of an on-off switch, I, I think that does make the idea of trying to control proliferation a nightmare. I agree. Um, and that's why, personally, I think anything that has the capability of autonomous action should be defined as an autonomous weapon system, even if it's not used in that mode. Um, so I would recommend that regulations encompass anything that has the capability of being switched to a fully autonomous mode as being considered an autonomous weapon, even if it's not so, for example, many uh, systems that I would consider autonomous myself uh, are not considered so because they're not used in their fully autonomous mode today. I think that's sort of a, dis a from the legal standpoint, that's a distinction without a difference. It's a quest question of usage, not a question of whether or not they're autonomous. Um, and ideally, I think we would have, to the extent we would be developing new weapon systems or, or controlling the ones that we have, there would be a huge focus on just capability. Uh, in terms of cyber and what is, what is a weapon, a uh, weapon is usually defined as anything that can cause death or destruction. Uh, certainly cyber actions can do so. We have sort of intentionally bracketed uh, among ourselves the issue of autonomy in cyberspace um, and the autonomy of cyber weapons as sort of its own complex question and issue, I think, that deserves maybe its own full panel discussion uh, because the issues there uh, related to s speed of response, um, dual use infrastructure are somewhat distinct from the sort of physical autonomous weapon systems that we're talking about today. But certainly that is an important issue and, and one that the U.S. government just didn't know how to handle <laughs> in its directive on autonomy. It intentionally bracketed the whole thing itself and said well, our policy isn't applying to that because it's just inherently different. Uh, in terms of self-defense, yes, there, I mean the reason states are interested in autonomous weapon systems is because they have a lot of benefits, and not just from a military efficacy standpoint, but certainly politically, the more robotics that we have, the, um, augmenting armed forces, the, the less human lives that are at risk. Um, arguably, uh, and I, I personally believe, there's a possibility that increased autonomy in weapon systems will reduce risk to civilians on the other side of the gun. So I think that the possibility of autonomy in weapon systems can reduce risk to human lives, both from the people employing them and the people who are uh, facing them. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you dealt with some of those. Um, so uh, if, if I'm, uh, I'll sort of invite both, both of you ask for sort of um, points about what are the, uh, what do people say are the benefits. Um, uh, Rebecca's mentioned um, some of them. Uh, certainly, what people are advocating for them are, often say is that uh, you know humans are subject to emotions, uh, hatred, desire for revenge, um, or, or on the other hand, uh, falling asleep, uh, turning up drunk, or whatever. So, uh, you know, a, a machine would be much more clinical in that respect. Would not. Um, uh, would not be subject to the the things which cause humans to to commit uh, to commit bad acts. Um, I, I would say in, in theory that's correct, but in in practice, um, if we're looking at say, a complex battlefield, 
uh, we're still a very, very long way away from the point at which uh, artificial intelligence can tell the difference between uh, a combatant that is injured and lying on the ground and a combatant which is lying prone and uh, aiming at you. Um, so it's, uh, I, I think that point is maybe valid at some point, but isn't valid now. Um, uh, cost, uh, I would say, is a key issue. Um, if you have, uh, say, a, uh, an autonomous um, uh, craft, uh, it doesn't need a human to supervise it. Uh, that, therefore, you don't have to pay for that human. You don't have to pay them a salary, pension, health care benefits, etc. Uh, so uh, I, I would say reducing cost would clearly be one benefit. Um, uh, uh, and as, as Rebecca mentioned, um, there's clearly a political um, uh, advantage in ha being able to have military action where there are no uh, pro prospect of casualties on your side. Um, people don't seem to care very much about ro robots being destroyed. Um, there are no bodies coming home uh, in coffins. Um, uh, but uh, so that, that certainly is in terms of the political expediency that that's possibly one argument there was, there's an old said that also raises the prospect that if there's no possibility of casualties that may make people more likely to, to authorise a military action um, sorry okay, just two fingers on that um, which can be bad right the idea of more war because of autonomous weapon systems because of reduced risk is a problem the flip side of that is the possibility of uh, more likely, the greater likelihood of humanitarian interventions and willingness of states to engage in actions uh, for the protection of civilians that aren't their own if there's not a risk to their soldiers in doing so. Yeah. I think they've answered the questions really well. Just a comment on the cyber thing, because that's, that's a really important one when you ask the question of what is a weapon. Um, and it's nothing to do with this whatsoever, really. But, <laughs> but in, in cyber terms, they talk all the time about cyber attacks um, when you're talking about actually it's equivalent to phone tapping. And the whole metaphor based on the whole war metaphor being used for cyber, I have problems with because then it means people are saying, well, we'll respond with kinetic force, so treating it as a weapon. Clearly, there are times when you cause physical effects with a cyber weapon, uh, like opening the Hoover Dam and killing lots of people. That would be, that would be a cyber attack. Uh, but it's used much too readily, in my opinion, and it causes a lot of confusion. <coughs> But I would just like to say something as well about this, this idea, as you mentioned, which is a common meme. Uh, robots won't seek revenge, they won't get angry, they won't commit rape. Of course they won't, because they're bloody stupid. Uh, they can't do any of those things. But the thing is, they're weapons. That's a misunderstanding. That little meme gets into your head and creates a complete misunderstanding about what a robot weapon is. Because the same people who want to round up women and use it as a weapon of rape, the same people who want to get angry and seek revenge, now will have a new weapon to enable them to do that. The gentleman here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Omer Guem from the Austrian Institute, the Netherlands. Um, I have a few observations and a few questions about Article 36 of the of the additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions. Um, part of the issue is perhaps also the um, the actual review of weapons, because that's not it's not really clear to what extent states are reviewing their weapons. It's uh, I mean, some Western states are, to a certain extent, transparent about what they do, but uh, other states aren't, including major uh, arms uh, exporters. So uh, uh, that's part of the issue of saying, well, there is an obligation. Yes, there is, but to what extent are they actually reviewing those weapons? Um, and also, with, uh, uh, with as, as regards Article 36, uh, there's also the issue of weapon versus weapons platform. What when autonomous weapons uh, or, or autonomy is put into a weapons platform, then you can't really talk about Article Six anymore. So uh, how how do we regulate that then? Um, and sh should that be something different than autonomous weapons? Um, and uh, with uh, as regards uh, responsibility, uh, there's a question. Perhaps 
you could also take into con consideration state responsibility. So not so much criminal responsibility, but uh, the responsibility of states for wrongful acts. Uh, and that is perhaps a venue to address the issue of autonomous weapons. Um, as um, with respect to the um, failing system, I have a question for Noel, whether he had, uh, he has data, had access to data about the uh, use, the targeting of uh, the system, uh, either live or in, uh, in simulation, uh, and what your conclusions are, if you had any uh, access. Um, and as regards um, uh, regulation, uh, and this goes to all of you, uh, what about the regulation in terms of limits to range or yield of the weapon? Would this be a possibility for um, controlling uh, autonomous weapons? That's it. Um, just to point out, today, uh, at lunchtime today, uh, the <coughs> Stockholm Institute for Peace Research uh, produced a, a report on Article 36 weapons reviews, and it would be, I have an advanced copy, it's really worth reading about the difficulties, and it's not the difficulties I presented, it's a whole series of other difficulties of getting nations to actually do it. And, and as far as I'm concerned, you could do, uh, you could do weapons reviews if the, if the uh, use of the systems is extremely limited, then you could do it. Of course, you can see, can something go to its coordinates, that kind of thing. But I think that any open-ended, which is what I'm most concerned about, autonomous system, I can't see how it can be done, except, I mean, it can be done over time, so you make a lot of mistakes and you find out. But, but generally, there's a problem with, with Article 36 weapons reviews, and I know that the, the CCW review is coming up in 2016, and one of the big topics there is transparency in weapons reviews. For instance, do you, if you find a weapon to be no good yourself uh, and you're not going to use it, would it be a good idea to give the data to other states so that they know not to use it as well, less technical states? I mean, there's, there's that kind of discussion going on, which I think is very important. But as far as the phalanx is concerned and that class of weapon, the reason why... Uh, the campaign I'm involved in is keeping those on the table is not because of them as they exist today, but you really have to think about how are they going to be extended. And an example is the mantis that I described earlier for shooting down mortar fire. If you read the small print specifications, which I do as a techie, you know, I, I get into that, um, you'll find that they say that the same way of using the trajectory and the speed of the mortar, you can determine its source and you could fire back automatically. And then I start to have some humanitarian problems because was it remote controlled by somebody sitting in the middle of a village? So that's why we're keeping those on the table because we want to discuss where are you going with them. You can't just say you can have these and then you find they're deployed against people in an indiscriminate way later on. And the whole point about you know all this regulation is all very well, even bans and treaties is all very well, but everybody in this room knows if it was a major conflict or a major war, it's all thrown out the window anyway, as we've seen before, so that, that's you know, a big worry. So no data on the phalanx whatsoever because I'm not classified, uh, but I have spoken to a lot of people, including people who work it and operate it, and I'm pretty convinced it's all right, apart from shooting down the odd Iranian airliner, um, it seems to have been used okay. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, the, the weapon or the platform, um, I mean, certainly in the conventional arms I usually deal with, um, the, you, you talk about a weapon system uh, or you include uh, the platform amongst a uh, you know, definition of arms. So uh, you say a, a bomber that doesn't have any internal armament, just drops bombs or launches missiles is still, is still a weapon um, in terms of how the, uh, the laws of war are. Should be or, or should be regulated. Um, that would be my view, anyway. Um, in terms of the uh, looking at range or yield, yes. I mean, you know, that, that's pretty much some of the, the things I was talking about earlier. Whereby, uh, you know, you if you're looking at how regulation or prohibitions may come about, it, it could be that you have a threshold um, for for those things or many other things. 
um, whether uh, do I think uh, either are a good idea. Um, it's very difficult. Uh, I mean, even if you have uh, you know, a, a low yield weapon with a short range, um, it, it could still cause uh, sort of very many bad effects if it's um, uh, you know depending on the context of which it's being used. Um, uh, but then, you know, I, I would say that I come from a peace research institute. So. All right. Um, with regard to Article 36 reviews, the issues there of compliance are certainly not unique to autonomous weapon systems. And, and that is my concern with them as a solution to the autonomous, you know, the autonomous weapon system accountability issue, or more general compliance, um, and I, I think autonomous weapon systems are only going to complicate the possibility of, a, of Article Thirty Six reviews, especially to the extent that you have the possibility of machine learning in field. Right, then that sort of tosses out the possibility of just an initial review uh, out the window entirely. Uh, but I don't think that's unique to autonomous weapon systems. Right, like, I'm very curious to read this report. Um, with regards to state responsibility, yes, no, that is it, what I am arguing is that using, you know, ideas from the draft articles on state responsibility, that states should be held responsible for the actions of autonomous weapon systems they deploy, regardless of any criminal liability. So some things that's more akin to tort liability. Uh, I, I have a piece called War Torts in which I'm arguing for that states being held responsible for the actions of autonomous weapon systems in a way that is not mutually exclusive to individual criminal liability, that there, it would be a situation where you could have both individuals being held liable from a criminal standpoint if they acted intentionally or recklessly, but regardless of whether or not an individual could be held liable, that states should be held generally liable as well. One thing in that, just, just as a matter of interest, is that, the, for instance, the United States have not ratified an agreement with the International Criminal Court of Justice. So in actual fact, you can't hold any U US personnel accountable or responsible for their actions in the, in the field, except domestically. So I, I wouldn't hold out a lot of hope for that. <laughs> uh, the gentleman in the pink shirt. Um, yeah, uh, Mark Bromley from, from CIPRI. Um, thanks very much to Noel Sharkey for flagging up. It's not a report that I worked on, but um, I hear it's very good, and it's up on our website now. Um, just two, two quick questions. Uh, I think, Rebecca Krutoff, you, you mentioned the issue of proliferation, and that this was, and I think a couple of you mentioned this, this, this is a gap that needs to be filled. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that. I mean, where exactly is, is the gap? I mean, all of the weapon systems that have been described during the panel would be subject to the export controls of the state where they're currently um, being developed and used. And we already have regional and now with the ATT international instruments seeking to oblige states to take into account <clears throat> particularly IHL considerations when, when considering the exports of military equipment. So what's, what's the gap that needs to be filled with regards to um, the proliferation of these systems? I mean, an autonomous tank would be subject to the same controls as a, a non-autonomous tank. Um, and then, and then Noel, Noel Sharkey, you, you said you, you mentioned that um, you're not interested in, in controls or bans on autonomous systems, but only autonomous weapon systems. I mean, in practice, how easy is it going to be to draw that distinction? I mean, a couple of people have mentioned the, um, the driverless cars, which Google and whatnot are, are developing in the US. And there's at least a couple of people have made the argument that if you, just, you know, fiddle with the algorithms and stick a bomb on that, then you've got you know, an autonomous um, you know, suicide vehicle, which have been widely used in the battlefield in Iraq and Syria and elsewhere. Um, if you want to try and affect that, I mean, you've got to go beyond just the defense industry and military standards and but how realistic is that going to be? And at a certain point, I mean, everything that we're talking about now is about the responsibility of states, that the solutions lie with states. They're the ones who are going to enforce these things. But we're increasingly, and in the discussions yesterday as well, we're, we're talking about a lot of technologies here where you've really got to get industry and 
you know, for them to take responsibility here and for them to kind of get on board, and even, you know, academic research communities as well, and how much work is being done in that field, because this, it seems to be a particularly appropriate here where, you know, the abilities of states to solve these problems is, you know, is, is dwindling uh, on their own. Um, and I think the discussion today underlines that. Uh, thank you. We'll be starting again. Uh, in terms of export controls, there's the, there's the, I can't remember what it's called now, 38 states, mainly European, have signed up to the missile something control, which limits, certainly limits drones, but only to a certain weight so they don't carry nuclear weapons. What? That's it, MTCR. You should send me the microphone. Um, but I think that when you look at export, control, export controls, the United States, for instance, don't sell uh, armed drones as a good example to anybody other than their closest allies. But that's being changed. And, and China have made it very clear that they've identified a hole in the market and they've already sold armed drones now to, to Iran. So there's not, there's not very good export, export controls at all. And certainly I can't think of many for autonomous weapons. I mean, as you say, conventional weapons like tanks, etc. But maybe you'll be able to talk about the, I'll leave that to them to talk about non-proliferation since they brought it up. Um, but about the other important point was like the autonomous car with a bomb in it. Well, the, I don't know if you know this, but the FBI in the United States has come out very strongly about the autonomous car for that very purpose because you could load a lot of them simultaneously with bombs and send them into a city and there's nothing, you could really stop them all. Uh, there are problems. And when I say I'm not against other forms of autonomy, I, I'm, sp I'm using an I here in the sense of the campaign I'm working on. Um, personally, I write and work on everything from childcare with robots all the way through to autonomous vehicles, so I, I look at every aspect. Um, but they're not so pressing as, as one that's about targeting and killing people. That's got to be the most pressing issue. And I don't think we can... You can't say, well, we ban autonomous cars because they might carry bombs. You might as well start banning washing machines because somebody might put a booby trap in them. It's, it's just not possible. And the thing, about, the thing about going for a ban, and as Rebecca said, it's really created international discussion, which has made me very happy because we didn't have that before. So as far as I'm concerned, that's a very good thing. But the thing about a ban is whether you can verify it or not, it certainly sharpens the mind and focuses on a particular problem, and it stigmatizes the weapon. People might do black testing and they might do sneaky use of it, but it's going to be sneaky use, really. I, I would say. So, so having a ban, you might not be able to completely verify, but why should that stop you? You've got to do something about it. The alternative is, oh, well, just go ahead and build, develop what you like and let it go. Um, yeah, certainly. Um, uh, when we're talking about export control, uh, I mean, I, I think that's an example of what I was um, talking about earlier in that, you know, obviously all countries which are likely to be producing these kind of weapons uh, already have export control regimes. They already have, as you know, complex um, regulations, international treaties, etc., on, uh, on export control. Um, however, um, when we're looking specifically at autonomous systems, um, what we don't have at the moment is any kind of common agreement on, on what's acceptable. Um, so, you know, hopefully that... Um, that may be introduced in the future, um, but without that, uh, the uh, the worry is uh, you know, that if you if you don't have a common agreement, if it's all done at a national level, then you may have, uh, to a certain degree, a, a sort of race to the bottom in, in which states are competing with each, with each other for markets. Um, <coughs> with uh, with proliferation, um, one of the key issues goes back to the software point I was making earlier. Um, uh, that if the the physical properties of the machine may may not be autonomous, but if you can update the software, you could create uh, an autonomous machine. Now, uh, as you'll know, Mark, I mean, software and transfers of software are, are, are also regulated in terms of arms export control, but actually enforcing that uh, is, is extremely difficult. Um, and knowing when uh, a software has been uh, moved from one country to another... Um, 
uh, it, it, it's, it's far harder to regulate that than it is to regulate the physical movement uh, of, uh, of, of, a, of a physical object. Um, so there, there's, a, there's a proliferation concern there. Um, I, I, I absolutely agree um, with you in terms of needing to get other actors other than states on board. Um, and you, you need to have uh, an, an awareness um, amongst the people who are you know, creating, speci- especially the software, of w- what are the implications of, of, of producing something like that. And so I just want to second a lot of what my co-panelists said about proliferation, that a more a specific legal regime for autonomous weapon systems and non-proliferation, like we have uh, you know, the non-proliferation treaty for nuclear weapons, could be very, very useful just in, in clarifying the law as relevant to autonomous weapon systems. Um, and that, yes, we need industry on board. I think it's sort of the job of... of civil society and and scholars to clarify to industry why it would be useful to them to be on board. And um, so I'm I'm hoping to do more of that and and to see more of that to uh, to clarify to industry why it's not just in their best interest to produce an even more intense (laughs) or robot uh, robotic system, but why it's why it's to their benefit to um, create inherent um, opportunities to, sh- to shut systems down, to limit proliferation. Just to, catching up on that, I, I think that's a really good idea. As long as the non-proliferation isn't the same as nuclear, where a certain number of states are allowed to have it. Um, final one from the gentleman in the blue shirt. So just, just one minute. Uh, Christopher Watson, British Pugwash. This is a subject I know almost nothing about, but I'm listening with interest. One of the things that struck me is that a lot of the discussion, perhaps most of the discussion, has uh, related to the concept of battlefield. And I have a feeling that an awful lot of modern warfare doesn't have battlefields in the sense that you've been implicitly talking about. It's been uh, terrorist activities, uh, non-state actors, situations where there are lots of warring parties and there are real problems of identification of friend or foe or civilians. And my impression is that most of the systems we're talking about are not very strong on identification. Uh, And I just wonder what thoughts you have about uh, whether there might be a a minimum requirement for identification before such devices could be used. I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, one of the things I've been working on, well, several of us have been working on with Amnesty International, Christoph Haynes, who's the Special Rapporteur for Extrajudicial Killings at the UN, and we've been working very hard to get this into the Human Rights Council. He wrote a report about it. There are a number of human rights issues with these, this technology, and not just non-state actors, but it's beginning to come into the civilian world. For instance, um, there are now... Uh, North Dakota have passed a bill about a month ago allowing police to arm their drones uh, with, with less than lethal weapons, which means rubber bullets, you know, tasers, etc. There's a company in, and they're not autonomous yet, there's a company in South Africa who've got the Skunk, a company called Desert Storm, which is armed with uh, tear gas and uh, fires plastic balls, and they've sold it to 25 mining companies with the idea of busting strikes. Uh, striking miners. They've sold them abroad massively to uh, undisclosed law enforcement companies to the point where they only sell 50 at a time. Now you have to put in an order 50 at a time. They've opened a factory in Oman and they're opening one in Brazil very soon as well. But there's an autonomous version and only in Texas of course but in Texas there's an autonomous version that um, hovers above your property and if you enter the property, it gives you a warning to leave again. And if, it's called Cupid because it fires a taser dart at you. So this is one of the real problems. And non-state actors will definitely get a hold. Look, I'm sorry to say that if you're not worried about making systems that are very, you know, will comply with the laws of war, if you don't have that worry, I could bring you a, a killer robot. I could make one within the space of two weeks that could come in here, and the only discrimination would be it would kill humans or animals but not shoot the furniture. 
that's the kind of discrimination I could get you. So it's not very hard to do. It's easy to buy off-the-shelf robotics. I don't know how you stop proliferation of that because you can buy all the off-the-shelf robotics and I'm sure you'll be able to download the code for running it with autonomous weapons very easily. I don't know how you control software because nobody's ever managed it yet. Nobody can ever do it. I mean, China were in General Atomics factory and Bloomberg reported this, General Atomics factory and Kinetic factory and Bloomberg br brought me what they were downloading and it was all the control boards for the robots and they saw them in their system for three years and could not get them out. So the idea of stopping non-proliferation of software would be, except it has to be very specific. So you're right, this, this is the real problem. Other problem is authoritarian dictators. You don't have a problem of soldiers firing on their own people anymore. You have a lot of backroom you know, workers, backroom programmers, programming your weapons for you so that they can go out and shoot, shoot your population for you. So it, it's not, not a good thing in terms of civil society or the use by insurgents. But sorry, I'll let um, yeah, uh, yeah, certainly there's been a lot of concern from human rights organizations for the, the, the reasons you said. Um, other than sort of non-battlefield uses, uh, I mean, where you've seen systems that have been developed already has been on base security. Uh, so you have a robot, I mean, basically a robot sentry. Uh, they haven't been widely used. They're not very good. Um, but certainly that's, the, that, that's one thing where, in, certainly in terms of cost grounds, you can, you can see a, a robot being more attractive than having to pay for a, a human to, to stand or patrol along a, 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 the boundary of a base, etc. In terms of the situation of modern warfare, uh, and, and against non-state actors um, uh, employing anti-terrorist uh, uh, means of warfare. Um, a lot of the issue here isn't with the technology, right? The technology perhaps allows for greater surveillance, allows for a certain level of precision, precision in what, you know, what area is targeted. But the issues and the mistakes that are being made are due to issues with intelligence, right, and issues with identifying the specific targets. And I, you know, that is, that is a much larger issue than as relates to autonomous weapon systems, right? We see that coming up and up again in the drone debates where I don't think the issue there is, is drones. I think the issue there is the practice of targeted killings and the uh, possibility of signature strikes, if everyone's familiar with that terminology. Yeah, it, that, that, is, that is not something unique to drone warfare. It's something that drone warfare enables, uh, but it's the policy that needs to be addressed and debated and refined. And, and uh, so, yeah, I <laughs> think it's, it's less technology and more the practices. Sorry, I didn't know. I realised we didn't answer your question about identification. You've got things like face recognition. Iris is difficult because you have to get people to stand still. Face recognition is now getting very advanced. But if you're worried about that, just paint a line on your face there and two eyebrows there, and it's gone. I mean, you know, it's, it's quite it's quite easy. I know how the algorithms work. It's not they're not hard to fool. So on that note, um, let's bring this to a close. Thank you for your time today, and thank you for. For all the panellists that have been great, and uh, I think coffee should be outside. Question.